Welcome everybody to pattern recognition. So today we want to look a bit into the first storage of neural networks and in particular we want to look into the Rosenblatt perceptron and look into its optimization and the actual convergence proofs and convergence behavior. So let's start looking into the Rosenblatt perceptron. So this was already developed in 1957. And the main idea behind the perceptron is that we want to compute a linear decision boundary and we assume that the classes are linearly separable. And then we are able to compute a linear separating hyperplane that minimizes the distance of misclassified feature vectors to the decision boundary. So this is the main idea that is behind the Rosenblatt perceptron. So in the following, we assume that the class numbers are plus and minus one, and the decision boundary is a linear function, and it's given as y star equals to sine of alpha transpose x plus alpha zero. So you could say the alpha is the normal vector of the hyperplane and alpha zero is essentially the offset that is moving the plane away from the origin. So we essentially compute the signed distance of the vector x to this hyperplane and then we only map to the sign of the signed distance, which is then either minus one or plus one. So we're essentially only interested whether we are on the one side or the other side of the plane, and this can be mapped by the sign function. Now, if we want to optimize this problem and essentially determine optimal parameters for alpha and alpha zero, then we can determine them by the following minimization problem. So we define some function d of alpha zero and alpha, and this is given as minus the sum over the set m, where m is the set of misclassified vectors, and then we compute yi, so this is essentially the ground truth label, times alpha transpose xi plus alpha zero. So if you look at this equation carefully, you understand that yi is the ground truth label, so it's either one or minus one. And you see here then if I compute alpha transpose xi plus alpha zero, I'm computing the signed distance. So we know that for a misclassified sample, the two will have exactly the opposite sign. So you see that we essentially will get a negative value for the bracket, then we will have a positive value for yi, because only in this case this would be misclassified. And of course, we can essentially flip the sign on both samples and we will also get a misclassification then. So only in the case where both have the same sign, we would have a correct classification. So this means that everything, every element of the sum has a negative sign. And this is why we are multiplying with minus one in front of the sum, because only then we will get positive values. So now you see that if we minimize this, we're essentially minimizing the loss that is caused by all of these misclassifications. So we essentially see now that the elements of the sum depend on the set of misclassified feature vectors. And this essentially can change in every iteration. So every time I change the decision boundary, I'm changing the set of misclassified samples. So this is a huge problem because the set will change probably in every iteration. So the cardinality of M is a discrete variable and we kind of have competing variables. We have the continuous parameters of the linear decision boundary and the discrete cardinality of M. <laughs> 
So let's look at this objective function that we seek to minimize. We already explained this in detail. And if we now want to minimize, we of course need to compute the gradient of this objective function. And you see if I compute that with respect to alpha zero, it is simply the sum over all the yi in the misclassified set and we have the minus sign still in front. And if we compute the partial derivative with respect to alpha, you can see this is minus the sum over yi times xi. Now we can essentially look into the update rule and let's look into the special case where we update after each visited misclassification, then we essentially get a new estimate of our alpha zero and alpha in every observed misclassification and we immediately choose to update. So we update from k to k plus one and you see now that in brackets we write the new iteration step and we choose this vector notation and we see that this is of course the previous iteration what we've seen in step number k and then we have plus lambda that is essentially the step size of our optimizer times yi and in the other entry of this vector, we have yi times xi. Generally, the lambda can be chosen also to one, which is a simplification of the update step. So the procedure would then end up in having some input with training samples with the different xi and yi in the set S. And then we initialize, for example, with alpha zero in iteration zero with zero and the vector alpha in iteration zero also with all zeros. And we initialize of course k with zero. Now we repeat and select a pair x i y i from the training set. Then we compute the distance to the classification boundary and multiply it with the membership. And if this less than zero, so in this case, we have a misclassification. Then we compute an update and the update is simply the old vector plus the observed pair in this vector notation. And we get the new parameter sets and we also increase the index K. Then we repeat this until we have positive values for all our samples. This means that all of our samples are classified to the right decision boundary. So you see, this is a very neat way of writing up this signed distance multiplied with the class membership to produce always positive values for correctly classified samples and negative values for misclassified samples. So the output finally is alpha zero at iteration K and alpha at iteration k. And of course, we require everything to be classified correctly. So this means that this algorithm will only converge if the set of observations can be separated by a linear decision boundary. If this is not the case, we will iterate until infinity. So the algorithm will simply not stop. So this update rule is of course extremely simple. If we classify everything correctly, then essentially nothing will happen. And the parameter alpha of the decision boundary is essentially a linear combination of feature vectors. So this is an interesting observation. Let's look in this into some more detail. So we see that the decision boundary can now be formulated in the following way. So we observe that alpha can actually be replaced with the sum over all the samples yi times xi transpose and then x the new observation plus the sum over all the yi and this would be essentially equivalent to the alpha and alpha zero as we've seen previously now that we know this we can also reformulate this and pull the x into the bracket and then we essentially see that decision boundary is given as a sum over the yi times the inner product of the observations and the new sample plus the sum over all yi. And yeah, this is a very interesting observation. So we also have something that you should keep in mind here. We have some set E and the set E is 
essentially the list of all indices that required an update. So we essentially store the entire training process in this list E. And this also means that some indices may appear more than once. But if we consider this, then we can write the entire decision boundary simply as a linear combination of all the training observations. Also a pretty interesting concept. And you will see that this concept will appear again in later lectures when we talk about support vector machines. And you will see that support vector machines solve this problem much more elegantly than the Rosenblatt perceptron. Also, the final decision boundary is linear and it depends on the initialization. So depending on how I choose the alpha zero and alpha in the initial step, I will get a different convergence result and I will get a different decision boundary. And also the number of iterations can be rather large. So in this very simple optimization scheme, we might have many update steps. And as I already mentioned, if the data are not linearly separable, the proposed learning algorithm will not converge. And this will then essentially result in cycles. And this may be hard to detect in the proposed algorithm. There is also a convergence proof for this algorithm. And this is also introducing already interesting concepts that we will later reuse in support vector machines. And the idea for this convergence theorem was also given by Rosenblatt and Novikov. And the idea that they propose is that if you have a linearly separable set of points, then you can essentially use this distance to the optimal hyperplane. So the optimal hyperplane is now described as alpha star and alpha zero star. Then you can see that these variables form the decision boundary. So you have the inner product with the xi, and this gives you the signed distance to the optimal separating hyperplane. And this is then again multiplied with yi. So this will always be a positive value. So this essentially gives us a signed distance on the right side of the decision boundary for all our observations. And then essentially they postulate some variable rho and rho is now just a scalar, but it is a lower bound to this distance to the hyperplane. So this means essentially that there is some kind of margin, some kind of minimal distance. And this minimal distance is very important for the convergence. So if I have two point sets, that are far apart from each other, then this row will be rather large. And if I have two point sets that are close together, then rho will of course be very small. And this rho is very crucial for the convergence of the algorithm. Also note that we choose alpha star to have a norm of one. So this is really a normal vector. And then we also introduce some variable m. This is again a scalar. And m is simply the longest L2 norm that appears in the training data set. So this is simply the maximum over i of all xi and the 2 norm of that. So if we define those quantities, then we can give an upper bound for the number of iterations. And this upper bound is given for k, the number of iterations. And you can see that this is alpha star zero to the power of two plus one times one plus m square divided over rho square. So you see that the value of alpha star zero is very important. Then the maximum norm that appears in the training data set is kind of important. This will increase the number of iterations, but the distance between the optimal hyperplane and the samples, this will then decrease the number of iterations. So the larger the margin between the two sets, the more easy the algorithm will find a solution. So this is an interesting observation. Also interesting is that the dimensionality of the features doesn't appear at all in this bound. So this bound is completely independent of the dimension of the actual feature space. 
Also a very interesting observation. So let's look into this bound, how it's being constructed. And the first thing that we want to look at is essentially the inner product of the current set of parameters and the optimal ones. And if we look at this inner product, then we can of course see that the constellation that we found in K is created by a previous observation, K minus one, because we're iterating, right? And we did this update with the vector yi and yi times xi. So we can easily split this up. This is our update rule. That's perfectly fair to do it. Then we can move in our optimal decision boundary. And now let's look at the right hand part of this update step. And here you see that we essentially do the projection of our point onto the hyperplane and it's multiplied with yi. So here we are computing exactly the quantity that we've seen earlier. So the quantity that we are projecting the point onto the hyperplane and multiply it with yi. And we've already seen that this has a lower bound. So this is again bounded with a lower bound by the minimum distance that is between the optimally separating hyperplane and every point. So we can plug this in here in row. And then we also see that we have several of those update steps, right? So this brought us here and we see that we can essentially repeat this process all the k times that we needed to find the particular update step. And in all the k steps, there is this minimum step size that we have to go, which means we generally have a lower bound for this inner product with k times rho. So this also means the more iterations and the more misclassifications we have, the more the vectors will be aligned. So if we do misclassifications, then this will also help us with aligning the vectors to each other. What else can we do? Well, let's look at the upper bound for this inner product. Yeah? So this is, again, the inner product of the current parameter set and the alpha star, so the optimal separating hyperplane. And here we can now apply the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for inner products. And we see that this has an upper bound by the two norm of the two vectors multiplied with each other. This, of course, makes sense. Then let's look again into this in a little bit of more detail. We can see that we defined the norm of alpha star as one. This means that we can spell out the two norm directly, which is then alpha star zero to the power of two plus the actual norm of alpha star, which is one. And then we can also look in this in a little more detail. So let's see what we have here. In the first term, we have this current update step. So the two norm here, the two norm squared now of alpha zero and alpha in iteration k. And we can see again that the current configuration was of course composed of previous update steps. So we go again into the previous iteration and see here that this is essentially constructed from the previous one plus the new observation. And this is again a two norm. Then we can see that this two norm can actually be spelled out as a product of two vectors. And if we do that, then we see that we essentially get a quadratic term in alpha zero and alpha. Then we get a mixed term where we essentially have alpha zero alpha times the observation and the class label. And then we essentially have again a quadratic term that is essentially only dependent on the current observation. So if we look closely at this, then we can see that the inner part is again the projection of the sample onto the hyperplane. And this is the previous set of parameters. So we know that this term is actually negative. So if we look at this, then you see that this inner product is again exactly this yi times xi transpose alpha k plus 
of a 0k and because this was a misclassification we know that this term will always be negative. So we can essentially say if we neglect this term then we will always get an upper bound and therefore we can simply do that and we get the norm essentially of the previous constellation plus the norm of the observation that was misclassified and now we can see that for the right hand part we essentially have vectors xi all the other elements are in the yi and we can see that this inner product is then bounded by 1 plus m square because we can only have 1 and minus 1 for the yi's and of course the xi has the maximum length of m. So this is why we can bring up this boundary and then we can also see that we can repeat this step of unpacking over the iterations and of course we can repeat this another k times which brings us then to the upper bound of k times 1 plus m square for the entire updated iteration steps. So this is a nice upper bound for the two norm of the current constellation of our parameter vector. Now we can go ahead and put this back together. So we have seen that we have this inner product of the current configuration with the optimal configuration. We've seen that on the left hand side we have the k times rho as a lower bound and on the right hand side we have essentially the norm of the current configuration of the parameters times the norm of the optimal configuration of the parameters. Now let's put in what we learned earlier. So we've seen that we can get this upper bound of alpha 0 k and alpha k with the k times 1 plus m square. So we can also put that back in. Then we essentially get the right hand side upper bound and the left hand side lower bound for this inner product. And now we can go ahead and rearrange the whole thing. And we see now if we take this to the power of 2 and divide by k and rho square, we get an upper bound 4k that is given as we introduced it earlier. So it's dependent on alpha star 0 to the power of 2 plus 1 times 1 plus m square divided by rho square. So this is already the derivation of this upper bound. Now, what are the implications of this? The objective function changes in each iteration step. The entire optimization problem is discrete and we have a very simple learning rule. But remember, very important, the number of iteration does not depend on the dimensionality of the feature vectors. And this is a very important property that we have here in the perceptron. And we can see that this is quite beneficial and we will use very interesting tricks when we speak about the support vector machine where we will reuse these ideas. So now that we have been talking about the perceptron already, we will have a quick detour and we will talk also about the multi-layer perceptron, which is essentially a combination of multiple of these perceptrons. It's also a very popular technique right now that is also very heavily used in the techniques of deep learning. So I think we should talk about this very coarsely. If you are interested in the basic ideas, we will summarize them in the next video very shortly and then if you like these ideas, you can probably also attend our class Deep Learning, which will go into depth about all the neural networks and so on and all the exciting ideas there. Here in this class, we will only have a quick detour and then we will continue talking about the classical optimization strategies of the machine learning and pattern recognition methods. Again, I can recommend literature. so. Pattern Recognition and Neural Networks is a very good book from Cambridge University Press 
And again, I can recommend the elements of statistical learning. And I also prepared some comprehensive questions that can help you with the exam preparation. I hope you liked this little video and I'm looking forward to meeting you in the next one. Thank you very much and bye bye.